All right, there's a story behind this door. <laughs> no, there's a story behind this story. Uh, this is one of those early stories. My mom was reading it to me, and uh, that's, that's like, these guys are strolling along this place, you know. Oh, you see this house, you know. I got a memory about that place. One night I was down here at night. I, up there at that corner, you know, the, there was a little girl running. And this guy was coming around the corner and he just stomped all over. They, when they ran, they ran into each other, right? And he just trampled her and she was screaming in agony, you know. All these people came running out. And I went and I grabbed the guy and I brought him back. We want compensation. Eventually it came down to that, you know. They had to call a doctor and stuff like that. So, Alright, so he steps in the door, comes back out with a check for a huge sum of money, you know, with another man's signature on it. Right there, like, he's like, no, it's genuine. <laughs> we don't believe you. So they, they, they go back to the guy that caught the guy's house and they wait till the morning. All of them. He's like, I'll go with you and we'll go to the bank. You'll see it's it's a real check. And then they cash the check. It's like, man, this guy, something is not right with him, right? Well, my mom, you know, was reading this to me. And it was kind of when I was at the age where it's time for me to start reading on my own. And she didn't have time to read for me hours every night. You know, I think I was seven, six you know, it's time for me to go to school and, and, and stuff like that, take a little bit of that. But before that, she had read a lot to me. So, today I want to revisit on this thrilling installment of the episode of the chapter of The Thing. If this is The Reading Cow from Another World, ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves to be astounded and amazed. Beyond your wildest enthusiasms and stuff. Alright, The Story of the Door. Let's see if my stuff is working here. Oh no, it's not. Okay, now it's working, ladies and gentlemen. Hold on to as you see it again from the top. <laughs> the story of the door. Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile. No. Cold, skinny, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment. Lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. Uh, at friendly meetings, and when the wine was to his taste, something eminently human beaconed from his eyes, something indeed which never found its way into his talk, but which spoke not only in these silent symbols of the after-dinner face, but more often and loudly in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone, to mortify a taste for vintages. Chin, man, you'd be better off drinking the vintages. Was it too costly? Is that the reason behind it? Gin is cheap, right? I drink me some gin to stave off my desire for a delicious bottle of wine, right? Because the wine is costly and the gin is dirt cheap. Right, um, and though he enjoyed the theater, had not crossed the doors of one for 20 years, but he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering almost with en envy. These keyboard layouts... Um, At the high pressure of spirit, okay, I should go back. But he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds. And in any extremity, inclined to help rather than to reprove. <laughs> I inclined to Cain's heresy, he used to say quaintly, I let my brother go down to the devil in his own way. And this character was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of down-going men. And to such as these, so long as they came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanor. No doubt the feat was easy for Mr. Utterson, for he was undemonstrative at the best, and even his friendship seemed to be founded <coughs> in a similar 
capital, 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 capital universality of good nature. It is the mark of a modest uh, man to accept his friendly circle, ready made from the hands of opportunity. Turn off reminders. Let me turn this off. Reminder off. It is the mark of a modest man to accept his friendly circle, ready made from the hands of opportunity. And that was the lawyer's way. His friends were those of his own blood, or those whom he had known the longest. His affections, like ivy with the growth of time, they implied no aptness in the object. Hence, no doubt, the bond that united him to Mr. Richard Enfell, Enfield, en Enfield, <laughs> Enfield, his distant kinsman, the well-known man about the town. It was a nut to crack for many what these two could see in each other or what subject they could find in common. It was reported by those who encountered them in their Sunday walks that they said nothing, looked singularly dull, and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend. For all that, the two men put greatest store by the, these excursions, counting them the chief jewel of each week, <clears throat> and not only set uh, aside occasions of pleasure, but even resisted the calls of business, that they might enjoy them uninterrupted, resisted the calls of business, Doing your business, going to the <clears throat> men's room and pooping and all that stuff. Man, I did not even do my business. I didn't want to miss a minute of the Sunday walk. Uh, okay. It chanced on one of these rambles that their way led them down a by street in a busy quarter of London. The street was small and what is called quiet, but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays. The inhabitants were all doing well. It seemed and all emulously hoping to do better still and laying out the surplus of their grains and coquetry. So that the shop front stood along the thoroughfare with an air of invitation like rows of smiling saleswomen. Hubba hubba! <clears throat> Even on Sunday, when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage, the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighborhood, like a fire in a forest, and with its freshly painted shutters, well-polished brasses, and general cleanliness and gaiety of note, instantly caught the, and pleased the eye of the passenger. <clears throat> Two doors from one corner. On the left hand, going east, the line was broken by the entry of a court. And just at that point, a certain sinister block of buildings thrust forward its gable on the street. It was two stories high, showed no window. Nothing but a door on the lower story. And a blind forehead discolored of discolored wallpaper on the upper and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged and sordid negligence. The door, which was equipped with neither bell nor knocker, was blistered into stain. Tramps slouched into the recess and struck matches on the panels. Children kept shop. <clears throat> Upon the steps, the schoolboy had tried his knife. Wait a minute. The schoolboy had tried his knife on the moldings, and for close on a generation, no one had appeared to drive away these random visitors. <clears throat> or to repair their ravages. Close on a generation? Spooky. Mr. Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by street. But when they came abreast of the entry, the foreman lifted up his cane and pointed, Did you ever remark that door? He asked. And when his companion had replied in the affirmative, I have. <clears throat> it is connected in my mind, added he, with a very odd story. Indeed, said Mr. Utterson with his light change of voice. And what was that? Well, it was this way, returned Mr. Enfield. I was coming home from some place at the end of the world about three o'clock of a black winter morning, and my way lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps. Street after street, and all the folks asleep. Street after street, all lighted up as if for a procession, and all as empty as a church. Till at last I got into a state of mind when a man listens and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. 
That's a weird state to be in. <laughs> All at once, I saw two figures. One, a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk, and the other, a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another naturally enough at the corner, and then came the horrible part of the thing. For the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was a hellish it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man, it was like some damned juggernaut. <laughs> juggernaut. Is that racist to say damned juggernaut? Because it's a it's a god you know, for in India, you know. Lord Juggernaut, right? But the procession uh, people are often crushed that, that when the, the Jagannath vehicle is pushed forward, it's a big procession for Lord Jagannath that happens on his festival day, and people are often crushed under it, right? So um, I guess the British Empire got this thing of saying, it's a Jagannath, you know, it's rolling along, it can't be stopped, it's too big, you know, it's an overwhelming force, it's a steamroller, like that. Um, it was like some damned steamroller. Uh, that would be a little bit PC. <laughs> I gave a few hello. Hello, hey, hold it right there. Took to my heels, colored my gentleman, <laughs> grabbed him by his collar, and brought him back to where there was already quite a group about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look so ugly that it brought up the sweat on me like running. The people who had turned out there were the girl's own family, and pretty soon the doctor for whom she had been sent put in his appearance. That's a weird sentence. Well, the child was not much the worse, more frightened, according to the sawbones, and there you might have supposed there would be an end to it. But there was one curious circumstance. I had taken a loathing to my gentleman at first sight, so had the child's family, which was only natural, but the doctor's case was what struck me. He was the usual cut-and-dry apothecary. What's that, a pharmacist? I think so. Right. Um, of no uh, particular age and color with a strong Edinburgh accent. I can't even imitate that. I'm supposed to have Scottish ancestry in my DNA. There is some. Yeah. Enough to be able to have a Scottish accent. But I <laughs> can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the night before Laddie was stretched. All the boys were paid him a visit. An Irish accent comes very, very naturally for me. So maybe my Scot Scottish ancestry was Dalriada or whatever that was, the Irish invasion of Scotland or something. Because those accents, if I pick up um, like a Martin McGinnis speech or something and start reading it, the accent just comes out. Some Irish accents don't. That particular one does. Northern Ireland, yeah. Um, all right, but uh, yeah, my ancestry going way back is uh, at least on on my mother's side. I know very little about my father's side, but on my mother's side, is definitely came from Ireland. All right, um, that's pretty well established. But what is the maternal line? It's just one thread. <clears throat> Well, sir, he's like the rest of us. Every time he looked uh, at my prisoner, I saw that sawbones turn sick and white with a desire to kill him. I knew it was in his mind, just as he knew it was in mine. And killing being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man we could and wouldn't make such a scandal out of this as should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. If he had any friends of credit, we undertook that he should lose them. And all the time as we were pitching in and red hot, we were keeping the women off him as best we could, for they were as wild as hoppies. Uh, I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. And there was the man in the middle with a kind of black sneering coolness frightened too. I could see that. But carrying an officer really like Satan himself. Yeah. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, he said, I am naturally helpless. No gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene, says he, 
Name your figure. Well, we screwed him up to 100 pounds for the child's family. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about the lot of us that meant mischief. And at last, he struck. He struck. The next thing was to get the money, and where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door? I was wondering when you were going to get to that door. Have you got attention deficit disorder? You digressing, sir? You need to take your, your uh, riddle in. Um, yeah, this was about that door. That's everything that we're talking about this because of that door. Yeah, remember that? Uh, all right, um... He whipped out a key, went in, and presently came back with a matter of 10 pounds in gold and a check for the balance on, on Coates's, Coates's, drawn payable to bearer and signed with a name that I can't mention. Though it's one of the points of my story, but it was a name at least very well known and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good for more than that if it was only genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal. This ain't no good check. Dairy party check. Um, <laughs> and that a man does not in real life walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out with another man's check uh, for close upon a hundred pounds. But he was quite easy in sneering. Set your mind at rest says he. I will stay with you till the bank's open and cash the check myself. So we all set off, the doctor and the child's father and our friend and myself and passed the rest of the night in my chambers and the next day when we had breakfasted went in a body to the bank. I gave him the check myself and said I had every reason to believe it was a forgery. Not a bit of it. The check was genuine. Tut tut, said Mr. Utterson. I see you feel as I do, said Mr. Enfield. Yes, it's a bad story for my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with a really damnable man, and the person that drew the check is in the very pink of the proprieties celebrated too. And what makes it worse, one of your fellows who, who do what they call good. Blackmail, I suppose, an honest man paying through the nose for some of the capers of his youth. Blackmail house is what I call the place, with the door in consequence. The blackmail house door blackmail house though even that you know is far from explaining all he added and with the words fell into a vein of musing from this he was recalled by mr utterson asking rather suddenly see he's like he's attention deficit disorder he needs to take his his adderall all right but yeah his musings he was musing ha, 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 so. From this he was recalled by Mr. Utterson, asking rather suddenly, And you don't know if the drawer of the check lives here? A likely place, isn't it? Returned Mr. Enfield, but I happen to have noticed his address. He lives in some square or other. And you never, af never asked about the place with the door, said Mr. Utterson. No, sir, I had a delicacy, was the reply. I feel very strongly about putting questions. It protects too much of the style of the Day of Judgment. You start a question and it's like, starting a stone you sit quietly on the top of a hill and away the stone goes starting others and presently some bland old bird the last you would have thought of is knocked on the head and in his own back garden and the family have to change their name <laughs> that was too good now you tell the truth to me right now do you even understand what this man is trying to say or not because I don't even believe you do. And I'm going to say it again. Let's see if you still don't understand it. That's for all you muckety mucks out there that think y'all English teachers and stuff. Because I don't hear it when I hear y'all talk. I, this English teacher was talking to me. And she was talking about, I was, I was like, this English teacher. Are you for real? You're an English teacher? I was like, oh, so what's what's your favorite writer? Oh, James Joyce. And, uh, yeah. And I, I like feminist authors. James Joyce, feminist author. What? Oh, well, then you would like Finnegan's Wake. 
I love Finnegan's Wake, and that's the truth, I do, but it's way over my head. I, I'm humble enough to admit, right, that I do get on the Finnegan's Wiki, right, when I'm going to read Finnegan's Wake, you know, because I just don't have the time. The man is a genius, you know, and he's, but I, I want to be more like him, right, but I have to get on Finnegan's Wiki so I, experts that have all the time to study it can do some of the work for me because it's hard to read. So here's the same series, like, Oh, yeah, uh, my favorite author is James Joyce. And I'm like thinking, isn't it like, it's like James Joyce, okay, there's some feminist writers that write about James Joyce, but I mean, come on, be for real. It's like, you, you might expect a person like James Joyce, a drunken Irishman, to be confused about women and not really understand women very well. Women are enigmatic. And he might blunder things with women. So I'm like, you, you know, and it's like, why are you saying, oh, so you're an English teacher. Uh, yeah, so, but the thing was, it's like, well, maybe maybe she was. But this is the thing. I think, oh, you're a feminist. Oh, well, I think about the dead. And the dead, when James Joyce, uh, what is it, her name? I think it's Lily. Look it up. Don't take my word for it, but. Lily, uh, kind of the protagonist or whatever, he like asks her something like, "What's shaking, baby?" No, he says, um, "How's your love life? Check it." You know, I think it's pretty much like that. He says something like, "How's your love life?" And she gets mad, and so he's like, "Oh well, gee," you know. And he's like, "He, it's like he doesn't even have a clue why." An Irish woman in his milieu, you know, in Dublin or whatever, if some guy walks up to her and starts asking about her love life, you know, what is on his mind? She knows, and she's pissed off. And it, he's drunk if he doesn't know what his, is on his own mind, right? What's she talking about asking her about her love life, right? That does not seem like a feminist author. It's, and he's like, well, okay, I'll... You know, I don't want you to be mad. Here's some money. Gives her some money. <laughs> I was like, you prostitute. You know, that's the way a prostitute would act. The way you act. <laughs> Are you for real? I don't know. That for me, when somebody says, well, I'm into feminism and James Joyce is my favorite novelist. I'm like, well, James Joyce is great. It's true. But feminist? <laughs> he seems to be clueless about women at best. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, I, I know there's some of these feminist writers that have written about James Joyce, cause, cause, but I don't understand it. <laughs> I read, you know, I, I, you know, if I'm interested in feminism, I, you know, I don't know. I look, you know, for, not James Joyce. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about what is that lady's name that I like so much uh, um, for fairness and accurate J, uh, Janine Jackson Janine Jackson like if I'm looking for a feminist Angela Davis Janine Jackson or something like that uh, uh, not James Joyce so I'm like oh you got it if you, but I give you the benefit of the doubt Maybe you're just lying, trying to act pretentious because James Joyce is all uppity, uppity here. You didn't expect that I had read a bunch of James Joyce. <laughs> but no, maybe not. Maybe you are really into James Joyce. So everybody that's really into James Joyce loves Finnegan's Wake. And the coolest thing, have you ever heard of Finnegan's Wiki? No, I never heard of that. I said, okay, well, it's a Finnegan's uh, uh, Wiki. Uh, it's a Finnegan's Wake Wiki which is a Wikipedia, right? Which means everybody can annotate. It means you can hyperlink the whole, uh, annotate the whole of uh, Finnegan's Wake. And people that really are into it, the puzzle, enigma solving with gusto people, right? They get on there and they, they go for every word and find all the, the meanings and allusions and stuff. Like, I think it's the most wonderful thing. I sincerely do. And it, uh, I said, when I get to it, I'm going to send you the link. He says, okay. All right, so a couple of days later, I was like, oh, I, I had put this on my list of things to give her the Finnegan. I'm sending you the Finnegan's Wiki. I don't need that. I have all that. I'm familiar with all that. Oh. 
You said you never heard of it. Uh, see that? Uh, that's just odd. Okay, so um, yeah, man. That's well, I you know. You got to give people the benefit of the doubt, and I've, I've I've lied. I have lied in my life to my mom. Ooh, and got a beating. Because <laughs> uh, I was I lied because I was scared I was going to get a beating, but then I found out I was lying. I got a beating <laughs> anyway. So eventually I found out I'm going to get a beat one way or the other, and then I had to deal with the lying on its own because it kind of got out of hand. Um, and I think that happens with kids that get a lot of whippings. <laughs> Uh, so I don't let my kid. So my kid may be spoiled, <laughs> but I hope that wisdom will get into her brain. All right. So back to this. Um, I said I'm going back to this again because I think this is great, right? So he's like, "Why didn't you research and find out the connection by the Jekyll and, and this?" Ooh, oh, I thought I'm not supposed to say his name. You know it must be talking about him, right? Because that's the name of the book. Right, okay. No, sir, I had a delicacy, was the reply. I feel very strong about putting questions. It partakes too much of the style of the day of judgment. You start a question, and it's like starting a stone. You sit quietly on top of a hill, and away the stone goes, starting others. And presently, some bland old bird, the last you would have thought of, is knocked on the head in his own back garden, and the family have to change their name. No, sir. I make it a rule of mine. The more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask. Now, you know, in those days, yeah. You didn't. You didn't automatically think gay. Uh, see, that's a an uh, uh, evolution of language. Queer was a way that people avoided saying homosexual. You know, they would not want to say that terrible word. Now we know it runs at about fifteen percent of everybody has that tendency, right? So. Is it so unmentionable, homosexuality? Yeah, some people, I'm not. But it doesn't bother me if somebody somebody is. Well, you know, they should not, um, you know, people, you know, you should be with some, you know, in a, a good environment. You should um, be honest with yourself and others about who and what you are and uh, find a, uh, an appropriate companion and a natural um manner you know go out do the things that you love in, in the community engage in activities and stuff like that like for a, a gay person if they're if they're uh, into um, protecting human rights and civil rights and stuff like that they can get into a, a gay rights community and find you know humanitarian people that uh, try to help their fellow man and those are you know probably it's an environment to find somebody who's not just looking for a little bit of fun, but somebody to have a long-term, healthy, stable relationship with. And, you know, all these healthy relationships in your life, you create all these, right? And you don't have any any place where you're, you're freer to do good. You don't have anything blocked up. Right, minimize the the bad that you do and increase the the good that you do. Yeah. Uh, I, there's always, you know, I, when people talk about right and wrong, I'm like, look, we do not know what is correct and incorrect, the consequences of, of our actions, and as as human beings, we should task ourselves with finding the the good and right decisions, the correct decisions to make about things. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, see, that's some insight into the ADHD mind. So I saw, you know, the, the guy the guy said, no, sir, I'm making a rule of mine. The more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask. Right? So Queer had already probably picked up that negative connotation, but it was not, you know, here... At this time, probably not referencing the H word. <laughs> All right. Uh, a very good rule, too, said the lawyer. 
But I've studied the place for myself, continued Mr. Enfield. It seems scarcely a house. There is no other door, and nobody gets, goes in and out of that one, but once in a great while, the gentleman of my adventure. There are three windows looking out on the, the court on the first floor, none below. The windows are always shut, but they're clean. And then there is a chimney, which is generally smoking, so somebody must live there. And yet it's not so sure, for the buildings are so packed together about the court that it's hard to say where one ends and another begins. The pair walked on again for a while in silence, and then Enfield said, Mr. Utterson, that's a good rule of yours. Yes, I think it is, returned Enfield. But for all that, continued the lawyer, there's one point I want to ask. I want to ask the name of that man who walked over the child. Well, said Mr. Enfield, I can't see what harm would do. That it was a, a man of the name of Hyde. Hmm, said Mr. Utterson, what sort of man is he to see? He is not easy to describe. There's something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. Can we have an example, like one example? This is a device, right, a literary device, where it recognizes, and this is something that I feel people miss. I've, I've had criticisms of this kind of device, uh, uh, of not actually giving one example, a descriptive example of what it is that you actually mean by any of these adjectives, right? Uh, but the idea behind it, a way of taking it, is that you recognize that what is detestable or horrible or not, every, every different person has a, a nightmarish uh, uh, something deep in their psyche, right? Uh, and and by not actually giving a single concrete example of what the guy looks like, just all these epithets, right? You give the reader the ability to imagine in their mind uh, what what, and that's going to be unique for every person. And I think in a certain way that's that's an element of building, uh, you know, timelessness or. Uh, uh, cl uh, classic uh, character to your writing. Although I don't, people, uh, you know, I, I don't see this book when I'm when I'm walking down the street and I see somebody reading the book, I don't see them reading this book. <clears throat> but the story behind me coming here on the special episode of the Reading Cow thing, what's my jiggy show thing that this is right is talking about when I could not read so I can still remember that so that's the point behind me doing this and I'm gonna get back to what that is but first I'm gonna finish reading what my mother read to me all right um, I know I never saw a man I so disliked and yet I scarce know why he must be deformed somewhere it gives a strong feeling of deformity although I couldn't specify the point He's an extraordinary looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. No, sir, I can't make, I can make no hand of it. I can't describe him. And it's not one of memory, for I declare I can see him at this moment. Mr. Utterson, again, uh, walks some way in silence and obviously under a weight of consideration. You are sure he used the key? He inquired at last. My dear sir, can and filled, surprised out of himself. Yes, I know, said Utterson. I know it must seem strange. I saw. I thought everybody said these these two guys never talked on their walks, but they talking a lot. Okay. Yes, I know, said Utterson. I know it must seem strange. The fact is, if I do not ask you the name of the other party, it is because I know it already. You see, Richard, your tale has gone home. If you have been in exact event, uh, in any point, you had better correct it. I think you might have warned me, returned the other with a touch of sullenness. But I have been pedanted, pedanted, I asked for a pennant, not a pedant, a pennant, not a pedant, but I have been pedantically, pedantically exact, as you call it. That, that That's a reference to me, the feebles. Uh, all right. The, the fellow had a key, and what's more, he has it still. I saw him use it not a week ago. Oh, I thought so. Mr. Utterson sighed deeply, but said never a word, and the young man presently resumed. 
Here's another lesson to say nothing, said he. I am ashamed of my long tongue. Let us make a bargain never to refer to this again. I talk. You talk too much, you worry me to death. With all my heart, said the lawyer. I shake hands on that, Richard. I ne never mention it again. Search for Mr. Hyde. Well, this brings us to the end of this thrilling installment of the chapter of the episode of the thing we ran over, folks. Um, the reading cow from the world. Uh, with Zorro rides again. No. This is uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And um, when I was little, my mom read stuff to me, right? And she read this to me. And uh, when the child was trampled over, I vividly remember her reading that, you know. And very early I had an idea that this book had something to say about alcoholism. Uh, you know, not overtly, but maybe in a metaphorical kind of way. Uh, so, I'm reading it to you for your enjoyment and your edification and stuff. And, oh, no. I went to this book as a child on my own and tried to read it. I wanted to know what happened, right? I wanted to know what the, the mystery, what was the connection between these two people and stuff. Of course, they're putting in all the Bugs Bunny cartoons and stuff. Horrible Frankincense monster, Mel Blanc, and, and you know, and, and then the movies and stuff like that. And then you don't get back to the wonderful uh, book. So we're going to read it here. This is part one. Tune in again for the search for Mr. Hyde. Hold on to the edge of your seat to be thrilled beyond your wildest, whatever it is, thing, show, um, with the reading cow. Until then, it's not going to be then until we get around the time of when it is then. And then we'll see you again.